exist in 1946. American exceptionalism, it's debated in academia for decades, but the idea of a unique country set up not as a kind of accident of usurpation, but set up as a system of ideas or a system a systemization of ideas. You have this idea of individual rights and the rights to life, liberty, property, the pursuit of happiness. Could that be codified in the institutions of politics? Could that be set up with a system of checks and balances, as the Brits had taught us? It's not like this was out of nowhere. The Brits had taught, John Locke and others, that this was the way to do it, a constitutional system, not a pure democracy. America's not a democracy. It was not founded as a democracy. So she's exploring all these kind of things. The question is, I'm going to try to focus on the ec economics of it. But her distinctive contribution is not simply that capitalism is moral. Now here's where it really gets to be a fight amongst us, maybe intramurally. She said, the morality I'm talking about is rational egoism. She says, I don't really think the morality of the opposite, which is sacrifice yourself, Jonathan alluded to this, the idea of altruism, that moral sanctity comes from sacrificing yourself to others, which implies, by the way, that others will sacrifice, that you sacrifice others as well. She said, get rid of sacrifice entirely. Let's stop haggling over victims and seeing who will be the sacrificer and who will do the sacrificing and who will collect these sacrifices. She said, if we can come up with a morality that says no sacrifice at all, win-win relationships, not win-lose, not lose-win, if you want to put it in business terms. But interestingly, she was not the first to mention self-interest. She wasn't even the first to say that self-interest had to do with prosperity. Does anyone know who that was, actually? Aristotle, wow, I'm impressed. Yeah, a little bit Aristotle. But who's the first one to say the wealth of nations is caused by self-interest? Adam Smith in 1776, not coincidentally the same year as the American Revolution, and Smith says, and he's the father of economics, um, and says there should be a free economy, but he specifically says the pursuit of self-interest is what actually ultimately leads to the wealth of nations. But what's often forgotten is that in his moral writings, in something called the theory of moral sentiments, he said, I'm not telling you self-interest is moral. It's not. It's practical. See the distinction? It's not really moral. The Bible kind of tells us that the pursuit of money is vicious. So self-interest has this practical benefit of creating the wealth of nations, but we're going to be a little leery of it morally. Ayn Rand said, you don't have to be leery of it morally. Self-interest does not mean running roughshod over others like you're some kind of Nietzschean beast. Self-interest is pursuing, rationally pursuing your values. Others are included in those values. So it's not like you're an isolated, atomistic being on some uh, you know, desert. <clears throat> it's these mutually beneficial, mutually self-interested relationships that are crucial to capitalism. This is what capitalism celebrates. This is what capitalism institutionalizes. That's what she's defending. But notice you would have, from this view, enemies or critics, even from within the free market movement, who would say, what are you saying? Are you getting rid of faith and religion? Yes, she said, yes, actually, I don't think that's a very good basis for capitalism. Capitalism, she said, on a very basic level, relies on reason and rationality, as opposed to any kind of form of unreason. Going up the next level, she said the case for capitalism is egoism. What's the alternative to that? Altruism. Going up another level, she said capitalism depends on individualism. What's the counter to that? Collectivism. Going up one step further, capitalism depends on rights. What's the opposite of rights? Duties. And finally, the politics. You see how it's worked? There's a whole structure to this argument. The last level is government has to be constitutionally limited, not, what's the opposite? This unlimited majoritarianism that whatever the general will wants, they should get. Whatever the majority votes for, they should get, even if they vote away the rights of others. Right? She's rejecting all this. So one way of looking at this is there's a menu of choice you can have to defend the free society. There's a conservative approach to this. There's a libertarian approach to this. There's an objectivist approach to this. Is there some overlap or, or mutual support between them? Yes, but this is a distinctive view. We shouldn't be shy about saying it's a distinctive view. We should learn from each other about what the better or weaker views are, <coughs> that's the main point I wanted to bring here. Um, <coughs>